Hello there, and welcome to Women's Business. My name is Dr. Marianne Schalkos Smith, known to most as Dr. Daycare, and this is my co host, Amy Vogel. We'd like to welcome you to our mentoring program designed to educate our community on issues facing working women. We will be speaking to our guests in the areas of art, sciences, health, education, law, medicine, politics, community service, military, and business. The goal of the show is to provide information that comes only from personal experience and to pass this information down to our daughters, nieces, neighbors, family, and friends. Much of the content will relate to the guest speaker's journey in their profession, what they have learned most about this process, and what they wished they had known before this journey began. Since women-owned businesses are the fastest growing sector of our economy, my guests will close with what lesson they would like to pass on to the viewing audience. Thank you for joining me on Women's Business. I am honored to welcome Donna Sower Allied from Sower Financial Group. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on board. My goodness. And Amy would like to share a quote before we begin. Be thankful for what you have, you'll end up having more. If you concentrate on what you don't have, you will never, ever have enough. I like that. It's all about what you have and being thankful and grateful. Grateful and grateful. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about you, Donna. Yeah, thank you for having me today. Thank so you. I am a certified financial planner professional and investment manager with SOA Financial Group in Lincoln. I'm also a mom of three, wow. uh, so I'm a busy working mom. The kids love a shout out, so you're going to have to say hi. Connor, Grace, and Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what to show and say, Mom, you didn't mention me, so you didn't mention us. So what is your day like, like in the financial world? Sounds really intriguing. So money, money. money. I, money, money, money. So when my three-year-old wants me to not go to work, he looks at me and says, you don't need to help people today. <laughs> so the way I describe what I do is in that I help people. I help people be efficient with their money and efficient with their planning. Um, so a day for me looks like going into the office, uh, reading. We do, a lot of what I do has to do with reading. Uh, and then I have client meetings. So I'm meeting with people finding out or helping them decide what their goals are, uh, and then working with them to put plans in place that will help them achieve those goals. Now, the reading, why is there so much reading in financial planning? If anyone wants to get into financial plan planning, they might, they might think numbers only. So numbers is a huge part of it, yeah. but understanding what's going on in the economy, understanding trends, mm -hmm. there's a huge part of um, personal finance that I would say falls into the behavioral category. Oh. So understanding what motivates people, understanding why people make decisions is a huge part of it. So I, I think you can just, no matter what industry you're in, you can never read enough. Yeah. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. um, but part of it is also just reading up on news. Yeah. You know, how does what's happening geopolitically affect yeah. your money? Um, My husband is the an avid, <laughs> avid watcher of the news. And then I, he Which can be a mixed blessing. Absolutely, <laughs> and he's so much into finance. He's the CFO of our business. And it's interesting. He and he's in his seventies. So he's been doing this a long time. He like he'll watch the news and other aspects. He goes, "Oh, stock market's going down tomorrow." And I'm like, "How?" And here I am, like, "How do you know?" That? He goes, "Just because of the energy that's happening." Then he'll actually sometimes project it's going up. It blows my mind. You know, my father is the founder and principal of our firm, and he often says that the stock market would better be described as a people market oh, because wow. it people because it's behavioral and it reacts to the way we feel mm -hmm. about what is happening in the economy, about what is happening, um, you know, politically around the world and at home. And we do we we react with our dollars. Mm -hmm. So but why why see that. tell me like the, what's the, the psychology behind that? All right, so. Mind. People typically, I will say typically, not everyone, typically make money-based decisions on two factors, either greed or fear. And I don't use oh, those negatively. I'm this down. Greed. Yeah. <laughs> greed and fear. That sounds so like aggressive, doesn't it? But in, mm. in fact, uh, when we're fearful about our money, we don't invest. When we're feel fearful about what's happening around us or have a lot of uncertainty, we pull back. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be selling. That would be selling. Uh, if greed is the factor driving our decisions, um, you, you know that acronym FOMO, that fear of missing yes. out, we My might look back 
<laughs> and say, oh, the market has performed so well over the last several years. I've been over here missing out on it and I want to get in. And so that can be a motivator. Wow. Wow. There's a lot more to it. That's really like yeah, simplified, that, but. I think that's good. Yeah. To summarize yeah. it. Get yeah. Yes, it did. Yeah. So when the, do you get like those late night phone calls or emails when no, people I don't. are in any type of uh, fear mode? So I will say that no, I don't get those phone calls. And the reason that we don't get those phone calls is because. We talk to our clients about what to go. expect. There you go. We talk to our clients about what to expect because when I mentioned uh, uncertainty drives us to make fear-based decisions, if you know what to expect or if, if you have a plan in place that is meant to weather um, a negative market environment, mm -hmm. you're not going to be inclined to react. So you don't want to be reacting. You want to be proactive in your money decisions. Um, so if you put a plan in place and then you invest your money in a way that is consistent with your time horizon and the goals you want to accomplish, you're going to be less likely to make those reactionary decisions. And if you feel so like you I'm need to, we'll coach you through it. Yes. <laughs> we'll coach so through what it. I'm hearing is communication, communication, communication. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And how Absolutely. many people, uh, this is gonna be, how many people actually know what they're investing in and what they're doing? Like, for example, I get my statements quarterly mm -hmm. or I can go online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you that. can kind of you can look at trends right sure you can see like oh this is how much I think I'm going to make when I retire but I'm going to be honest until tax season where I'm like oh let me get these papers out I don't really look at it which is unreal because I am so you know retentive about money but for some reason I feel like oh that's in the future well that's actually a really good point the first thing I would ask you is what is the money for mm -hmm. is this money that's for retirement is that what this is like seriously yes. is that what we're talking about okay you're a young woman you have, I, I hate to tell you, but you have a while to go before you're going to retire. Oh, no. So you don't want to be making... Oh, let her write that down. <laughs> you don't want to be making short-term decisions yeah. about long-term money. Okay. And my guess is you're not going to retire in the next 10 years. Darn. I mean, it's totally possible that you have, you, you have a situation where you could... But if you're not going to be accessing this money in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. if this is more 20 or 30-year money, then you need to treat it like 20 or 30-year money. And if I asked you, do you think the market... And when I say the market, I just mean the S&P 500. Yeah. But if, do you think the market will be higher in 20 years from now than it is today? So. Do you? I do. I hope so. I think it will be yeah. higher. I would say so, yes. Then you don't want to be making short-term decisions about it. You want to stay invested. Yeah. And you should be invested for growth. Yep. Yeah. For that money. Now, if this is money that you want to use because you're going to buy a new house in five years, and this is down payment money, you treat that money differently, mm -hmm. that's short-term, and it should be invested differently. So we had talked a little bit earlier, but you are in a man's market, aren't you? I work in a heavily male-dominated industry. Let's talk about that. I do. A woman's business. This is going to be I great. Do. So, and uh, you know, people people can look at it in one of two ways. You can look at it as you know a, a detrimental factor, and that you know I walk into a room and it's all men, and there aren't a lot of people who necessarily uh, are going to communicate the same way that I communicate, um, or uh, you know ask questions or give answers in the same way I do. But I, I view it as an advantage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I view it as an advantage. Um, I was on a panel one time at Bryant University speaking to their CFP program. And it was me and three men on the panel. And a, a young woman asked how I feel about being a woman in a male-dominated industry. And I said, well, look up here at this panel. This is very much what it looks like when I walk into a room. About 25% of the people in a networking event are going to be female. That's okay because you notice me. Yeah. You notice me. I said, I walk into somewhere and most of the people in there are going to be men in dark suits. Mm -hmm. And I was next to three men in dark suits. Mm -hmm. And me in my green dress, I stood out. So you can use it to your advantage. Absolutely. You can absolutely use it to your advantage. Absolutely. Also, in my industry, um, you know, you said it, communication, communication, communication. Women communicate differently than men do. We do. We and really do. women in particular need to pay more attention to financial planning because women have different needs. We live longer, we make less money on the dollar, and we are more likely to be alone at some point in life than our male counterparts. And so for those reasons, financial planning is different from women, and we need to pay special attention to this. So I think we need more women in industry on my side of the table to help communicate with women and get them to better engage with their money. Now, do you feel like when you do meetings, I'm assuming, you, let's say you meet with a couple, mm -hmm. oh. Husband and wife. Most often I do meet with couples. And yeah. Who do you feel dominates the conversation in those meetings for you normally? 
So this is a definitely a generational answer that I'm going to mm -hmm. give. Because if I'm meeting with someone, uh, I would say under the age of 50, it tends to be more female driven. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm meeting with clients over 50, which I would say are the majority of my clients, the conversation is male driven. But I know, and you know from marketing, that decision making is female driven. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> repeat that again. <laughs> right? Yeah, right yeah. Men are very often the ones who have been handling this side yes. of the household finances. Yeah. Women handle the day to day finances, yeah. but men are very often handling these bigger picture finance issues the 401k that you discussed, mm -hmm. um, the long term planning, uh, the financing issues. Women are very, very good and tend to handle the more day to day tactical stuff. Mm -hmm. You got to bring these two pieces of the picture together. These have to come together to have a solid financial plan because if your budgeting and your cash flow doesn't support those bigger picture needs, there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. So you have to get both partners to work together. And, um, and what I said was, even though the men have been driving that bigger part of the, the planning, uh, we know that women drive dollars and decisions are made with dollars. Mm -hmm. So w women are driving those decisions. So when a couple comes to your office, they have a conversation with you, mm -hmm. the bottom line, how long before it actually happens that you think that they're gonna be one of your clients? So it really depends. I, I, Very <laughs> often people will come in for planning, um, yeah. and so then we'll do it on the spot. They're saying, okay, when can we make our, our next appointment? Because Very often people have been talking about this. Yes. Yes, They've absolutely. been talking about yeah. taking action for months, sometimes years, and yeah. finally, they are ready to make a decision to take some action. It's kind of like, you know, you need to clean your closet. Yep. And finally, one day you open it out and you pull everything out mm -hmm. and then you go to the container store and you buy everything and put it back in neatly, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's what we do. And I like to say that the first time you really engage in financial planning is very much like that. Um, now, when it comes to the investment piece of things, very often people are coming in to do a plan first and it might be a few years before retirement and before the majority of their money is available to roll over. Um, other times, you know, there's there's uh, money to work with right away. But I would say most people, by the time they make the decision to come see a financial planner, are finally ready to take action. As we sit here and talk, you are very, very in the know on financial planning. My goodness, well, young professional and female. I, I've been doing amazing. this for 13 it's, years. I'm yeah. wondering, was this a conversation at the dinner table when you were a kid? I mean, you know this stuff. You uh, do. I grew up with this. Oh, yeah. So as I mentioned, my, my father, Don yeah, Soa, is the yeah. principal of our firm. Wow. He's, um, he's been lot. in industry for over 30 years. So wow. I really did grow up with this. And uh, you know, he always encouraged me to get into this business. It's amazing. When he viewed that I had a mind for it, mm -hmm. I, you know, I had a mind for the business side of things, but that I also had um, uh, an inclination towards the education piece of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we do is educating our clients. Um, and and I, I definitely enjoy that. For a while, I thought I wanted to be a teacher. Oh, wow. I did. I thought I wanted to be a high school teacher. You're a natural teacher, um, though, in many different ways. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're all teachers in some capacity, yeah. right? If, yeah. if we're sharing our message. Yeah. Um, and so when, when I'm sharing with clients, it's, it's not to tell them what to do. It's to empower them mm -hmm. to take action. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, yeah, he definitely... I don't want to say pushed me into this, but he opened this up to me yeah. at a young age. It sounds like the conversation was there. You learned a lot about it. Then you decide, oh my goodness, I, I think I'll go there and educate people. Well, and we learn by example. Finance, <laughs> we learn by example. Yeah. And finance is such an important part of anyone at their solo or in a relationship. Finances is a very, very important part that people need to pay attention to from a very young age, and I don't think we got that message out there You know, yet. we very often work with people who are transitioning, because mm -hmm. when you're transitioning is a great time to take a look at your financial Could picture, right? Mm -hmm. So it can be transitioning um, into a new job. Okay. I've had clients ask me to speak to their, their young adult children about, hey, you've got a real paycheck now. How are you going to deal with this? And shockingly, you know, you're, you're going from making zero dollars to forty-five or fifty thousand dollars, and then realizing it doesn't go as far as you thought it did, yes, yes, right? Yes. Because of taxes and insurance, mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully withholdings for your retirement mm -hmm. plan. So understanding yeah. what that net paycheck is, mm -hmm. and then how to budget within it is a mm -hmm. big deal. And if you can start with that first paycheck, paying mm -hmm. yourself first, mm -hmm. and making smart decisions, and you know, living within your means and your budget. Yeah that really sets you up with good financial habits moving forward. Um, same thing with transitioning into a new career. Mm -hmm. A new career could mean 
could mean a lower paycheck. If, what if you're opening a business, you're starting a new business, you have a whole different subset mm-hmm. of, of variables you're working with. Um, and, and most of our transitions are, are out of work into retirement, I will say, which is probably one of the biggest transitions at all of all. Mm-hmm. And as you said, you mentioned being solo or in a relationship, yeah. people moving in and out of relationships due to marriage, death, and divorce um, mm-hmm. are all times to really be taking a look at your financial picture. Excellent, yeah. Well, it's, it's so funny because when my husband and I had our daughter, I Huge always, transition. I all of a sudden decided we needed have life insurance. You were correct. <laughs> so I'm like, we gotta have life insurance. What if we? D-? And it became like a thing. So we went to see someone. And well like, done. Did term life, and then we upped our retirement. Because now I'm thinking about long term. I think when you have a child, a lot of times you see a bigger pic. You see more years ahead of you. Yeah. You see their life as well as your life within that life. Mm-hmm. You see more years ahead of you, mm-hmm. and you see an a lot imminent more need. <laughs> an imminent need to get things in order. Mm-hmm. Good job. Well, it's just, I'm a planner. My husband just goes along for the ride. He's like, okay, fine, let's go. Well, it's back in the 70s when I got married. The first thing, my, my father didn't have much to say, but he just said, you will not get married without having life insurance, which brings that up. So I remember saying, well, Dad, what about, you know, like a pension or a, uh, a retirement? He, uh, at that point, he was 44 himself, so I realized how young he was, but at 19, you weren't looking at that. And he goes, oh, no, that doesn't come to much later in your 50s or 60s. Well, so the message has... Because back then, the message, they had pensions. Yeah, I was the message just has changed. The, yes. the language you used was very important. Yes. It, it wasn't necessarily on the individual to be planning yes. for the future in that way. Now, it really is in most cases. I would say yeah. the most cases, yeah, absolutely. A lot of private companies have gone away from pensions altogether. It's all 401ks. It's very interesting. With people retiring now, um, a lot of people being offered early retirement. I've, mm-hmm. I've got some uh, some large, some clients from large Rhode Island companies who have been offered early retirement. And you're really seeing the mix and the evolution mm-hmm. of uh, retirement plans. They have a frozen pension mm-hmm. from their early years at the company that they get oh, to roll over. But they oh. also have this defined contribution plan in the form of a 401k. So they kind of have like a, a multi-tiered yeah. Um, a multi-tiered retirement plan, uh, and we see it in, in the Rhode Island pension system as it is, the mm-hmm. transition from the old pension to the new yeah. 401A mm-hmm. and, and, and pension hybrid system. So we, we're, yeah, transitioning. <laughs> we are transitioning, and the message, I think, is a very different shade at the dinner table. I think yeah. young parents are talking to their kids as they go into adulthood. I, I really believe it's a conversation, like you need to get involved in a 401k. You're young, you should get it going. So the conversation certainly has changed. It has it's changed, fabulous. especially since you see students coming out of school with higher levels of debt, oh, yeah. very high levels of debt. There is a focus on financial planning and getting yourself set up well ahead of time and addressing your budgeting, your near-term, your long-term financial needs. There's definitely more of a focus on it. Um, and I've even noticed it, you know, with the age of people coming into the office for consultations, 13 years ago, I didn't necessarily have people in their 30s and early 40s coming in addressing long-term financial planning needs. Mm-hmm. A lot more are coming in now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot more are. And I always want to just say for someone who just signed up, uh, last month for Social Security, God bless America for Social Security. That mm-hmm. kind of adds to it. But today, if you were retiring, how much mm-hmm. do you think you need to live per year? What did you This thought? is such a personal question. Yeah, when I people know. ask me, can it's I retire? Personal. I say, sure, you can retire. The question is, what do you want what your you retirement want to, to look like? <laughs> yeah. I have clients who are fine on $3,500 a month of income because they have no debt. debt. Yeah. They have a very frugal lifestyle, and they're like, you know, so it's, it's all about choices. Yeah. I have other clients who can't live on ten thousand dollars a month; is not even close to enough. So it really is a very personal, mm-hmm. a very personal decision. And the number that's right for you is going to be different than the number that's right for somebody I, else. I totally believe that. My husband started getting Social Security five or six years ago. I go, honey, take your Social Security. I'm going to travel with your Social Security check. You never <laughs> had that before. That's what I'm doing with your check. So you're absolutely right. It's very individualized. It's very, very different, um, and what you spend is going to change throughout your, your retirement. You're not yeah. the same person at 65 as you are at 85. Yeah. How about, um, that's a good point, the aging population. Mm-hmm. When it comes to illness and all of that, how do you plan for that financially? Yeah, so we discuss that as longevity planning. That to me is like so, a scary, like having health. It is your scary, whole, but it's something that has time. to be addressed. Yeah. I mean, do you have anyone in your family who's reached the age of 90? 
Do you, do you know I don't anyone? think so. No? We're just doomed. I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. Oh, you know, I Maybe do, you like, can. You could be the first. I, have, I would be the first. Like, no, yeah. I've, I've had multiple grandparents live into their 90s. I knew wow. multiple great-grandparents. Wow. Um, so longevity is in it's my family. It's on your side. That's but awesome. with longevity comes, you know, it's not just how long do you live, but how well do you yeah. live? Yeah. And how is your health during that time? Uh, and I watched in my own family a progression of a very, very active retirement which would require a higher budget, mm -hmm. right? A higher budget um, in those early years, traveling back and forth between a summer home yeah. in the north and vacations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I really watch that change as you get older and you slow down a bit and you eat a bit less yeah. and you're less active, then to actually needing care. Mm -hmm. And that is the progression that most people will go through if they live into a, a, you know, an advanced age. That, that is the reality. So understanding what benefits you have available to you, working with a financial planner and also an estate planning attorney who understands elder care planning is very mm -hmm. important yes. because I think what you were alluding to is, you know, how do you pay for this stuff when you, when you find yourself needing that mm -hmm. very expensive care and you're either going to pay for it privately, mm -hmm. meaning out of your pocket mm -hmm. or long-term care insurance, mm -hmm. or you're going to spend down and go to Medicaid, and mm -hmm. that's going to help fund those long-term care needs. Mm -hmm. And the same, uh, you know, the same answer isn't going to be right for everyone because Absolutely. everyone's preferences are different. Everyone's financial situation is different. And what age do you think you should be planning for that? So, I'm assuming not at 80. It is not at 80 <laughs> because if long-term care insurance is something you want, you want to be considering that in your late 50s, early 60s. Mm -hmm. That's the time because. Uh, you, you don't get insurance after you're sick. You get it before you're aging, before you're sick. So you want to make sure that while you're in good shape is when you're addressing this. Um, and when it comes to the Medicaid planning side of things, there's a five-year look back. So you want to make sure you have considerations like trusts uh, and a spend down plan set up well in advance. Um, so really working with a team, a team of financial professionals, one of which could be a financial planner, an investment manager, a good estate planning attorney, um, and maybe a CPA is, is going to be crucial to uh, you know good, sound, long-term planning. It's a lot, huh? It is. It's a lot. It's a big factor in life. But you, it doesn't all really, happen at once. No, it doesn't all happen at once, but you've got to put that into the conversation, yeah. especially if you're in a relationship with someone. You've got to have that conversation about money. How old yeah. do you think someone should be at your office talking about this? So it depends what type of planning you're doing. Okay. I've met with folks like Amy and her husband who are, you know, want to make sure they're on track for retirement, but maybe also want to save for college yeah. for their children. So that is one type of planning. Um, the majority of people who come into my office are coming in because they are planning for retirement or have received an inheritance they need help with, something like that. Okay. Um, and so those are typically going to be people uh, you know, in, in their early 50s or, or after. Right. But it's never too soon to start addressing planning needs. Mm -hmm. it's, it's never too soon to address your planning needs. I think, I think money sometimes can be a taboo um, conversation with people, and it shouldn't be. It should be. We'll talk all about our operations and yes. our crazy yes. diets. And, and our, our yeah. diet, our operation, our help, but whatever. But money, money, I feel like, is like almost like an off-the-table topic. Thank you for, for bringing that up. I and totally I don't think it needs to be. I think it's just it it's just currency, it's exchanging of dollars. Money's a tool. Whatever. Yeah, money's a tool. Get you to where you want to go most of the time. It's a tool. <laughs> Thank you, John. Money is a tool. It, no, money is a tool. Yes. But we have money personalities. Yeah. We, like you were reading that quote. Uh, about you know contentness and finding happiness mm -hmm. in what you have versus always looking for more. That's very Marie Kondo, yeah. right? Yeah. That is that really does apply. And if you take that, um, you know that attitude of you know approaching with abundance but also simplicity and living within what you need, that can create a really nice framework for addressing your money and how you can use your money. Mm -hmm. It really can. So if you can approach your, your money as a tool and not with shame, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's a really big part of it if you can take that that's out of the equation. That's a good point. The emotion yeah. behind money, I feel. Yeah. It's, it's true. true. There's, there's so emotion much emotion behind money yeah. when it's just really a tool. Mm -hmm. And if you can make it objective, you can make better decisions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. I know your father played a major role into where you are today. Were there any other mentors along your journey to get you here into where you are? Yeah, I mean, he is hands down the, the biggest mentor that, that, that I've had, both in bringing me into business and, you know, 
uh, as a mentor along the way, uh, okay. still to this day, both as a business owner and as a financial services professional. Um, I would say something that's had a huge impact on my career has happened more in the last couple of years where, uh, as I mentioned, male-dominated industry, yeah. but I've engaged with other female financial professionals. Oh. Sort of along the idea that, you know, you're stronger together. The, the, you like quotes, so the idea yeah. that um, if you want to go fast, go alone. Yeah. If you want to go far, go together. Mm -hmm. I love that, and uh, I have a group of other uh, female financial professionals, we're, we're connected professionally. We meet on a call once a month, okay. and we approach this with such a sense of abundance, mm -hmm. where we come in and are talking about practice management issues, HR issues. We will share our portfolios with each other. What are you using in this yeah. space? Um, what have you found challenging in terms of marketing, or what have you found helpful in terms of marketing? We'll share templates with each other. I mean, we are, we are so giving, and when you can be giving, you receive, right? When you, yes, what you, you, you get what you put out there, yeah. right? You get what you put yeah. out there. So that has been a huge, huge part of my journey. That's great. Absolutely. So as you know, we're a mother-daughter team. I do know that. I would love give, me, that. give me some I advice. You have that. a lot of wonderful advice. They give me some advice to work with a family business. So I would say if you have a multi-generational family <laughs> business, um, the one of the biggest factors in our success is that my father never treated me like a child in business. He treated wow. me as a professional partner, a less experienced professional partner, but a professional partner. I mean, I've been doing this with him for almost 14 years now. It'll be, um, oh, it has been 14 years. It has been 14 years. Yeah. Excuse me. We are going on 15 years. Um, and, you know, he, from the moment I walked uh, through the door, he realized that I had an angle, I had a perspective, um, and I had something to contribute that, you know, he wasn't necessarily picking up on. And so it was very much, again, sharing. Mm -hmm. It was sharing and valuing each other's perspective and opinion. Wow. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's, that's and great I'm sure advice. you brought in a whole new market to the firm. Being younger, being female. Yeah, I would say being female has been mm -hmm. one of the biggest, uh, you know, one of the, the biggest advantages in that um, there are some people uh, who prefer to work with a female mm -hmm. professional. Mm -hmm. Likewise, there are some people who prefer to work with a male. Yeah. And when we can provide both of those opportunities, I think that we can help the most people. Your and and that's what both. you want to do in business, right? <laughs> yeah. you, you, the, the more you can get your message out, the more people you reach means the more people you're helping. Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. And I think what you said earlier about you and those women collaborating is amazing versus all having your own, like yeah. these are our clients, those are your clients, but you're working together. Um, I think that's huge. I think no, a lot of times as women, we get in our own little place, you need to come together, you need we, to work together. We do not approach mm -hmm. anything from the perspective of scarcity. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is about how there, there's plenty to go around. Yep. How can we help each other, uh, you know, serve more people? That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for, this has been an amazing show. We only have one minute left, which went by like a Second. Blank. Yes. If anyone wanted to get into financial knowledge. planning, what would be a quick path to it? So nothing super quick, yeah. but I would say, you know, go to cfp.net. That oh. is the CFP board website. Um, and you'll find access to resources and information there about programs you can engage in because there is an education component, a huge testing component, and an ongoing uh, ethics and education component to being a CFP professional. Um, likewise, call into the Money Talk radio show. Oh, our yes, firm, I listen to it, yes. Our firm has a, a radio oh, show yes. that's yeah. on weeknights, nightly on AM 790. Yep, uh, tune in. You, it's a call-in show. We address financial planning and timely investment topics. We that's also talk wonderful. a lot about the field of financial planning. I have that listened is, to yeah. it many times. Thank I'm you. I'm so glad. Like Old Compton. Thank that you. is wonderful. Donna, thank, thank you. you. Oh, Great show. It was Great a pleasure show. being here. Thank you for having oh, me. I love sharing the message. It's great. And speaking with women. Thank you. Thank you.